the Ten Commandments and also after the Ten Commandments to explain. There are three stages which are expressed in the Ten Commandments and also the aftermath, which was the Golden Calf. And these three phases every Jew goes through, whether in their lifespan, in other words, there's periods of the young, young youthhood, middle aged, and elder, and also in the day itself, which you go through. These three stages are called, and again, this is connected, it's a recap of the classes, the ideas in the classes of the past few weeks. The first is called light, the or and self shining to a person, when everything is just smiling at you, everything is great, you're on cloud nine, and you're flying, and everything is amazing. That's the idea of the or and self. Then there's the constriction of this light, in other words, being able to use the what's called the Rishimu, the memory you have of tasting and experiencing the light and living with it in a constriction where there's no light, yet you're able to salvage and hold on. The third one, which is the hardest one, is where it's total darkness. Each person in life, in our lifetime, we see this number one, when a person is young and he has aspirations, so there's a lot of light. And then when a person begins to get quote unquote hit and bumped in life, so he's holding on with his initial good intentions and everything. And then later on, there's the sad stage of elder people especially, where it's just total darkness and the chas most people are just waiting to die, God forbid. And of the three, the most important one, and the, the one that's the mo most going to determine the tikkun, the final completion of this world, is the stage of the darkness of the so Explain. We're going to stages to explain, and then we'll show it in the parsha of Zedash. <coughs> we have our forefathers, Abraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. Avram Avinu, the Gemara says, established Shacharit, the morning prayer. Yitzchak established Mincha. Yaakov established Arvit, Mariv at night time. Now the morning prayer, day, connotes understanding, clarity, you know, comprehension, to contemplate. That's the idea of, of the day, the light. That Avram Avinu revealed Shacharit, this signifies what Avram Avinu himself came to reveal. Avram Avinu was living in a time where Hashem was not yet made known to the world. In other words, even though there were tzaddikim alive before Avram Avinu, such as Noach, Metushelach, Shem, Ever, but they weren't able to reveal the awareness of Hashem to the world. They were tzaddikim for themselves. Shem and Ever opened an academy but it was restricted to those people who were interested. But they didn't have the ability to go out and to reveal Hashem in the world. Avram Avinu was the initial stage of revealing Hashem in the world. Like the famous story that Avram Avinu had a big achas at Orchim, many guests would come, and when fresh eating, they would say, thank you. And he said, don't thank me, thank the one who gave the food. You're not the one, no. Hashem is the one who brought the food, thank Hashem. So he did this and he was very wealthy, he was able to permeate and spread Hashem's awareness to the world, to bless Hashem, to make known Hashem. So that's the idea of this light, initial light, which is Avraham Avinu. Yitzchak Avinu, the son of Avraham, was able to take this light and then constrict it. In other words, to serve Hashem within a constriction. That there's now no light when it's difficult, and then to serve Hashem. Why is that connected to Mincha? The Gemara says that of the three prayers, you should put your most effort into davening Mincha. Why? Because Mincha is the most difficult of the three prayers to daven. Why? Because Mincha takes place in the middle of the day. I'm in the middle of work, I'm in the middle of lunch, and this and that, and I have business phone calls, my head is all over, all over everywhere, I have to just stop everything and go to daven. In the morning, when you wake up, you're fresh, it's a new day, you have a clear head. The Arvit, we're not going to talk about that yet, but Mincha, is in the middle of the hustle and the bustle of the day when everything is so upside down and you have to force yourself to detach and to cut. Even those who people are learning in yeshivas, for example, they're in a whole learning, they have to stop everything and to shift their mind into the davening. So there's a lot of effort and, 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 and energy required to be able to constrict where my head is and to focus it in the davening. 
So this was Yitzchak Avinu's quality. He was able to mitzamtzem, to be he's called Gvurot Yitzchak, the severities of Yitzchak, to take the light and now to constrict it. In other words, when there's no brain, there's no clarity, then to force the clarity in the constriction. That's the idea, the quality of Yitzchak. Yaakov has the hardest job. Yaakov Avinu is when it's total darkness. There's night, there's nothing. It's total darkness, and yet Yaakov Avinu is able to reveal Hashem in the total darkness. There's no, there's no, like, there's no handles even. Yitzhak Avinu, at least there's a handle, there's a constriction of the light, and at least I'm holding on. My job is to bring the initial light into the constriction. Yaakov Avinu teaches Ekir, it's the heel, there's nothing there, you're on the bottom, rock bottom. And yet, Yaakov Avinu, his power, is to reveal from the darkness, no handles, nothing to use from the darkness to reveal light. This is the power of Yaakov Avinu. In line with this, Chazal, the Gemara teaches that we have three temples. The first temple was in the merit of Avram Avinu. The second temple was Yitzhak. And the third temple will be in the merit of Yaakov Avinu. The first temple was connected to Avram Avinu because that was the building up of leaving the beginning of the Exodus, the beginning of entering the Holy Land. It was all to build up to eventually come to building the first Beit HaMikdash, like in the morning, the initial stage, the beginning, the first, first contact, the beginning. That's the idea of the first temple. Then it was destroyed. That 70 year interval was that the Jews had to hold on to the 70 faces of the Torah, the 70 facets of the Torah, that there's still a handle. There's 70 years until the second temple was built to Kenon, I'm still holding on to something. That's the idea of Yitzchak, being able to take the light in the constriction, join them together. That's the idea of Yitzchak. That's the second temple. Still, the second temple was destroyed, and now we're in the longest exile, and it's, go it's gone on for so, so, so long, and we've reached a point of, if you want to say, total darkness, and yet, this is where Yaakov Avinu comes into play. What is the idea of Yaakov Avinu? To shine light when there's total darkness. This is the idea of Ma Tovu Ohalecha Yaakov Mishkenotecha Yisrael. How good are your tents, Jacob? Your dwelling places, O Israel. So there's something here. There's a lot of depth in this pasuk to show what is the power of Yaakov Avinu today. I'm going to show this idea also in the parsha with Moshe Rabbeinu in the Ten Commandments. Ma tovu. Tovu is saying how good. When you declare good, when you have a choice of bad and good, and you choose to express and point out the good. So with the declaration given by Bilam, by the way, Ma tovu ohalecha. How good are your tents, Yaakov? If you remember, a few weeks ago, for those who were here, we explained the word ohel doesn't just mean a tent. Ohel also means light. Ma tovu, how good is the light of Yaakov? Ohel is light from the wording in the Pasuk in Eof. Be'ilo, a halo, a light. Be'ilo nero ale roshi. Shining the halo of the light, the candle over my head. Yeah, he was talking about the, the baby in the womb, learning the whole Torah with the light of the lamp in, in the mother's womb. He's able to see the whole world from one end to the next and learn the entire Torah. That's the idea of the Hilo, is that oh hell is a light. And we said like this, if you remember. We said that a, a, a tzaddik, his job is to enlighten the whole world, to bring them back to Hashem. But it works two ways. In other words, the tzaddik is only able to help Am Yisrael if they want to be helped by the tzaddik. In other words, it's a choice. Or I choose to seek out the Torah centers, the Batei Midrashot, Batei Knesiot, the study halls and the synagogues of the Tzaddikim. In other words, that delve in and learn in line with the guidelines of the Tzaddikim. Or I can choose what's called Chochmot Chitzoniot, Chochmot Haumot, Chochmot Ha'akum. I can choose alternative ways of psychologists, psychiatrists, of worldly usages of what they call solutions, quote-unquote, to try to help me enlighten my life. I have a choice. 
when the, when the tzaddikim are not being turned to, when Am Yisrael doesn't recognize the value of turning to tzaddikim, that causes the tzaddikim not having the ability to enlighten the Jewish people. It works in both ways. For the tzaddikim to help, that then there needs to be what's called an itaruta diltat, an arousal from below, that people are interested in tzaddikim to help them. When the tzaddikim don't have people turning to them for help and advice, etc., so the tzaddikim lose their level. We're going to see this coming up in Parashat Ki Tisa, when Hashem told Moshe Rabbeinu, Lech red ki shechet amecha. When the Jews did the golden calf, when they did whatever, the erva, whoever did the golden calf, and Moshe Rabbeinu was up on the, on the highest level, connected to the highest possible level of seeing the Torah Har Sinai, Hashem told him, go down, you're being pushed down now. Lech red. Why? Because your nation has, has, has transgressed, has blemished. And Rashi brings on the spot, that you can't have it that Moshe Rabbein is all the way up there and the Jewish people have de descended to the abyss, to the lowest levels. You also have to go down because your whole greatness, Rashi says, the Moshe Rabbein, the only reason why I gave you greatness is for the sake of the Jewish people. Now if the Jewish people are so low, what value is you being up here for? So Moshe Rabbein was also pushed down to show this connection that Sadiqin can help, but on condition that people are looking for that help. People are not looking for the help, they go elsewhere, so this causes a, a cover-up on the tzaddikim. However, when people wake up and realize that only the Torah, only Hashem, and the key for Hashem and the Torah are the guides, the leaders, the tzaddikim, when, when people turn to them as the, that's the only, only solution we have, this wakes up, so to speak, the tzaddikim, and we brought down the verse, Nashemesh Sam Ohel Bahem, the Shemesh, like the sun, the, the Shemesh, to the, 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 the translation of the verse from Tehillim, from Psalms is the Shemesh Samuel by him, that for the sun, he put its tent in them. The, Rabbi Nachman explains like this, the Shemesh is the idea of the Tzaddikim, because like the Gemara says, that Eli's son, Eli was the prophet, he was the Kohen Gadol, and he was the prophet right before Shmuel. Lo shak'a shimsho shel Eli, at shezarach shimsho shel Shmuel. Eli did not pass away until Hashem brought into the world of Shemuel to be the next prophet. And the terminology of the rabbis in the Gemara is the sun. The sun of Eli did not set until the sun of Shemuel rose. So that connection between the sun, the shining of the sun, and the tzaddikim. So the verse reads, La shemesh sam ohel bahem, that the, the, the light of the sun, ohel, which is the light, the halo, bahem, in the Jewish people the light of the tzaddikim, to be able to radiate this light in order to guide people to come back and serve Hashem is dependent on who? On the Jewish people, Bahem, if they are interested in it. And once the Jews show interest that they want this light of the Torah, they want the light of Hashem, they're asking the tzaddikim, give me this guidance. The tzaddik is like a chatan, the, the groom, coming out of the canopy. Chupato means also the covering is that now the tzaddikim are able to run super fast. Why is this needed, this running? He runs fast like a warrior. Why is this needed? Because in the period that the Jewish people were far, okay, so that period that they're far, that there's a darkness, there's a, there's a loss here. It's not like, okay, I'll, I'll gain it back afterwards. It was a loss and it's like it, it descended and the loss is double. So that when people get back on the right track, you have to still make up for the past. Something very deep. That in Judaism, when doing tshuva, number one, you're starting fresh from now. But eventually, when, you're, when you have good footing and you're able to run the track on, on the pathway of the Torah, you're gonna have to make up for the time that you were far from Hashem also. You have to make up for it. So you have to go faster to do for, to, for now and to make up for the past. The average person, it's hard for him to do that. The tzaddikim do that. The tzaddikim, that's what the verse is saying. That is like, That is like a chatan running, coming out of the canopy, the concealment, the covering up, and he's running. Why is he running? Because he has to help, he has to work double hard to help extract the Jews. Because when, when the Jews were far, it's one thing, but that he's also far, he can't lift them up because he's also far from them. In other words, he's, he can't do that much to help them. So they fall, it's, it's, like, it's like two people walking away from each other. 
So it's not just the distance of where they were starting from the point when they started to live. Like for example, they were starting at point zero. So the tzaddik is here, and the Jewish people go here. So there's a double loss here. So when the Am Yisrael wants to begin to come back, this wakes up the tzaddik to, to help them, but he has to compensate for double the, the amount which was lost due to that, this, that, that distance. So it's a double amount. So to make up for it, he has to go extra fast to wake them up. So now going back to the verse. Ma tovu o'alecha Yaakov, how good is your light, Yaakov? Because Yaakov symbolizes the tzaddik, the tzaddikim, who are able to shine this light in the darkness, in the total darkness. And the main key to connect to the light of Yaakov is what the verse says coming up. Mishkenotecha Yisrael. Mishkan is the idea of the Beit HaMikdash. It's called also Mishkan Mikdash. But also it's called Mishkan because until Mashiach finally comes and the third temple is finally built, we have in the meantime miniature beacons of light which represent in miniature format the future third temple. What are they? The, the study halls, the Batei Midrashot and Batei Knesiot, the study halls and synagogues, but specifically Mishkanotecha Yisrael, referring to not just any synagogue, any Torah study center, but those which belong to the tzaddikim. Like the Gemara talks about in the time of the Tanaim and Amorim, they would say, Go to Tsipori, to the yeshiva of Rabbi Wakadosh, Rabbi Yehuda. Go to, I forgot the name of the Rav, another, another Tana, another Amura, who's in Beit Sha'arim. Go to Rabbi Yochanan in Yavne. The Gemara goes on to listing, if you want to learn Torah from this tzaddik, you have to go to his Beit Midrash in order to receive from Rabbi Yochanan, from, from Yehuda, from each one of the Tanaim Amorim. They, they would specify you have to go to his Torah center in Tsipori, in Beit Sha'arim, in Yavne, to indicate the main way to receive from Yaakov, the tzaddikim of every generation, is specifically to connect to their Torah centers. Which means what on a practical level? It's one thing to learn the books, but it's a second stage, and it's also it's one thing to hear Torah classes and everything, but it's a second stage to make a commitment to become part of a Torah center, a Beit Midrash, a Beit Knesset, which follows the guidelines of the tzaddikim. So this is the idea of Mishkenotecha Yaakov. What you benefit is, is what it says in the beginning, Ma tovu o'alecha Yaakov. The main light that the tzaddik Yaakov is able to shine in the darkness is what? Tov. What is good? That you begin to value your good points. That, you, that your main key in the darkness, to get out of the darkness and to make a move forward, is to begin to value the good points. What's, so, what's the big deal out of that? Is that someone who's in the stage of Avraham or Yitzchak, meaning someone who's in the initial stage of a lot of light, or Yitzchak, where he's working now to take the light and constrict it, he has what to hold on. So such a person doesn't value as much his good points, because he has something. Who values his good points? Someone who's in total darkness, such a person who has not, nothing to hold on, no handles, nothing, nothing. I feel totally naked, totally empty, totally dark. Such a person, when shown their good points, they only then in the darkness begin to value it. So again the verse, Ma tovu o'alecha Yaakov, how good, in other words, how beginning to value the good points due to o'alecha Yaakov, the light of Yaakov, who was the one initiated, instigated Arvit, the, the nighttime davening. In other words, Yaakov is the one who's able, more than Avram and Yitzhak, he's called Yaakov Shlema, Yaakov, the complete one, is able to shine in the biggest darkness, such a light that a person cannot begin to buy his good points. How to, how to connect to the light of Yaakov? Mishkanotecha Yisrael. By being a part of, connected to, going to the study halls, of the tzaddikim, Mishkenotecha Yisrael. And now, a further point of what this darkness is and what it's not. Avram Avinu, as great as he was, he had an Ishmael. Yitzchak Avinu, as great as he was, he had an Esav. But Yaakov, mitato shlema. All of his children ended up tzaddikim. In other words, Yaakov Avinu, even though he connotes darkness, he connotes also completeness. We say 
in the Slichot and the governing of Elul and of the holidays, Yaakov Shelema, Yaakov the complete one, that he was able in such darkness to, to maintain his holiness, specifically in the idea of sexual desire. His, his holiness was illustrated in his children. Avraham Rabin was also an outstanding tzaddik. He like also, but there was still some klipa which was showed by having a Ishmael and by having an Esav. But by Yaakov, it was totally complete to show that this is the completion. The completion of the creation is the davka through total darkness to reveal the light. This is what Hashem had in mind in the whole creation. The whole creation was to come to what we're going through now, this final exile before the third temple, which is what? The Dafka Jews going through the darkness that they're going through, which is absolutely absurd, and it's crazy what people are going through today, and yet to hold on, yet to value every drop of good, for Hashem, this was the whole pinnacle of creation. To explain the idea a bit clearer, is what's called, in the Kabbalistic terminology, we just mentioned it earlier, what's called Itaruta Dil Ela, Itaruta Dil Tata, an arousal from above, an arousal from below. When Hashem created the world, everything was done from an arousal above. Hashem created. Hashem made the six days of creation. He created, let there be light. He had the, the sky, the rakia, the firmament, the grass, the trees, the birds, the bees, the animals, and then man. Hashem made everything. But for Hashem, the ultimate, ultimate revelation of His kingship is that someone from the lowest point should make the first move. And that is the stage we are in now, this final exile from the destruction of the second temple, leading now to visit Hashem, the building of the third, the third temple. Our job now is the whole goal of creation, is a dafka through the darkness, and that a Jew goes to what he's going through. He's blemished, he sins, he does all these terrible things, he has a difficult life, everything's upside down, in his mitzvahs, his Shabbat, everything's upside down, and yet, through all this, to be able to find tov, to find good, and to make initiative move of wanting good, this was the goal of all creation. And Dafka, this is what's going to build the third temple. As opposed to the first temple, which was built through light, the idea of Avram Avinu, because it was the initial beginning. So there was a lot of light in building the first temple, but it didn't last long. And then it was destroyed after 410 years, whatever the calculation is. And then the second temple, which was built by the, in the 70 years of exile, that they're still holding on to the 70 years corresponding to the 70 Shirim Panim La Torah, the 70 faces of the Torah, that as low as the Jews fell, that fell in Babel, still they were able to hold on to some memory of Kedusha, of what it's like in Eretz and everything. Still, the second temple was destroyed also. Now, we, in the final exile, that we feel so far from the Torah, we, see, we feel so far from the Tanaim, the Moraim, from Moshe Rabbeinu, we feel, on one hand, we feel pride of our Jewishness, but at the same time, we feel our distance, and God forbid, thoughts of futility enter a person that they don't know what to do. Yet, through this darkness, I show my initiative, my itaruta diltata, that I want. For Hashem, this is what builds the third temple. That's why it's taking so long. It's taking so long because of the difficulty in this process of Jews in such darkness Every time to find the good, to make a fresh start, to start again, Tov. Ma Tov Alecha Yaakov. This is Dafka, what's going to build the third temple. It's taking a long time because it's not an easy process. It's much more convenient to serve Hashem when it brings light, cameras, action, everything is great in life. It's beautiful and everything. That's one thing. But when it's darkness, people just want to wipe this day off the, off the map. This day is not part of the day. Let's go. I hope tomorrow will be a better day. We'll start tomorrow with Hashem to serve Hashem. Today is gone already. God forbid. So it's so it's difficult, but Dafka here is the work that no matter what, I'm able to grab some good and I maintain a good attitude, even if I've stumbled and I get angry and I'm fed up and everything, yet subconsciously, and I even express it in words, I still want good. I want to make a fresh start and collect good points. This is what Yaakov uses, Yaakov uses to build the third temple. With all this, it's a bit of deep ideas, I try my best to go as far as I can, but time is limited. <coughs> With this we can see, in a way, these three categories in the giving of the Ten Commandments. We know that the first two, sorry, before the giving of the Ten Commandments, Hashem told Moshe Rabbeinu, Hagbil Tahar, you have to do Hagbala. You have to make a fence around Mount Sinai, because when the Jews see my revelation in Har Sinai, 
they're going to want to come and just run. So you have to put a fence and two warnings. It was the first initial warning that Moshe told the Jewish people, you're not allowed to pass this line. There's going to be a border on the fence. It said, do not dread trespass. You're not to, to walk past this line. And then right before, on the 6th of Sivan, right before Hashem revealed the Ten Commandments, Hashem told Moshe Rabbeinu, go down and warn the Jews not to go up. And Moshe Rabbeinu said, but I already told the Jews. He said, no, warn them again, because the, the, their inclination to want to see me is so strong, they're going to forget about what you said. So that's from here we learn that you warn a person before, and right before doing the actual action, you warn them a second time, you give two warnings. So we learn it from this parasha of the second warning. So there was a Hagbala, and the wording of HaKadosh Baruch Hu is in the Torah, Pen Yersu. They might not be able to contain themselves, to constrict themselves, and that will make them disappear. They'll be, they'll be burnt by the intensity of this experience of receiving the Torah. Okay, fine. So then, what happened? There was the revelation of the Ten Commandments. We're taught, right? Rashi brings it down, the Gemara, that the, the Jews, as soon as they heard, they heard, the, they heard the first two of the Ten Commandments, Anochi, I am the Lord your God, and the second one, Lo Yelecha, you should have no other gods upon me. We taught that what? As soon as the Jews heard those two of the ten, Parchan Nishmatan, they all died. All the Jews died, right? And then angels had to come to revive them, to wake them up, and then Moshe Rabbeinu re revealed the other eight to the Jewish people. Okay, so one second. The whole purpose of the fence was so that they shouldn't pass out. They should have a boundary. But you see that it didn't work out. It didn't help because as soon as they heard the first of the two of the ten, they also died. What what was gained by by making the 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 the, Akbala, the fence? If in the end, anyways, the Jews passed out by the intensity, that the fact that they died shows that it was an intense night, they couldn't handle it, that's why they died. So why did you tell them in the first place to make the fence? If any was afterwards, they didn't pass out with them. Well, what did you benefit Hashem by making the Jews fence off of any ways, when having the revelation, anyways, they also passed out. So Hashem Dafka, this doesn't explain, he wanted the Jews to realize something very important. Who didn't pass out when all the Jews, all the Jews died in the first two? Who's the only one who stayed alive? Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu didn't pass out. The other Jews did pass out when they heard the first two. Moshe Rabbeinu, no. He was still intact. He didn't die. He had the ability to handle such a strong light because Moshe Rabbeinu personified like Yaakov Avinu. In the Kabbalah it says like this, that even though Moshe Rabbeinu corresponds to the sphere of Netzach, which corresponds to the right leg, if you compare that, that's called the anthropomorphic comparisons of parts of the body to the sphere. So Moshe Rabbeinu normally corresponds to Netzach, which is the right leg, but still, his ability is to go up to what's called in the Kabbalah Tiferet, which is the torso, which corresponds to Yaakov Avinu. Meaning, Moshe Rabbeinu and Yaakov Avinu are directly connected. Directly connected. So Moshe Rabbeinu signifies the idea of this tzaddik, Yaakov Avinu, who has both the light of Avraham and the constriction of Yitzchak, and in the greatest darkness, with those two, being able to reveal the light. Again, just to go back, we said about Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. Avram is only light. Yitzhak is too severe of constrictions. Yaakov Avinu is the balance. That when there's no darkness, he's able to take the light of Avraham and the constriction of Yitzhak, and in total darkness, be able to reveal Hashem. That's completion. That's the greatness. That's the goal. The goal is not to have just too much light, but also not to be too constricted, not to be too square. To be able to have a, a, a service, a revelation of Hashem, what's called in Hebrew, Behadraga Uvemida, in measure. To be able to serve Hashem, not over exaggerated in any extremities, middle pathway. But you need to be a master of knowing how to take the light and the constriction and put it together. That's the idea of Yaakov Avinu. So Moshe Rabbeinu was able to handle the first, the, the light of the first two and not pass out. The rest of the Jewish people did pass out. And then Hashem revived all the Jews and then commanded Moshe Rabbeinu to reveal to the Jews the rest of the Ten Commandments in order to teach Am Yisrael that you're going to need Moshe Rabbeinu. This is the point that comes up. The necessity of Moshe Rabbeinu in the picture is not just Hashem. Hashem wanted to inculcate, to teach Am Yisrael that you're going to need Moshe Rabbeinu for this whole picture. That's why I showed you that even though you were fenced off, you couldn't handle intensity, Moshe Rabbeinu did. And now, so that shows you that you didn't need him. 
he's a master of being able to take a big light and not get burned. Like we spoke about the idea of the tchelet. Remember we spoke two weeks ago about two opposites in one, the burning bush, the idea of the mess of the shlichut, the mess, the mess the being the message of Am Yisrael, of the, the idea of taking two opposites. And on one hand it's burning and yet it's not consumed. The idea that was Moshe Rabbeinu. We're able to constrict the light and not be singed by having too much light. And to be able to have the balance properly. So this is the idea of the first two commandments. And then Moshe Rabbeinu was able to filter the next eight, showing a constriction. So that means the Jews experienced two experiences. They experienced what it is to have light, or Eid Sof. If you notice, the first two of the Ten Commandments, everything is direct. Menochach. Anochi Hashem Elokech. Hashem is talking directly to the Jews. I am God, your Lord. And then the second commandment, Lo Yelecha. You should, you, you, you should not have. And the other commandments go in a general, you write, it's general. You should not, you should, it doesn't say you should not. Lotinaf, don't do this, don't do that. But it says you, you don't do that. Where it only says you, the nochach, is in the first two commandments to show that the Jews were given a revelation of this orange soft, this big light. And then from 8 to 10 is the second stage of within the constriction, Moshe Benu giving it over in a constricted format. Where was number three of the total darkness? The total darkness was after the Ten Commandments were revealed, when Moshe Rabbeinu went up for the first 40 days. And on the last day, the Yetzirah was able to trick the Jewish people. And, and what, what does Rashi say there on the spot, bringing the Midrash and the Gemara? That the, the Baldavar, he made total darkness and chaos in the world with the image of Moshe Rabbeinu's coffin floating in the air. And this was the biggest test, total darkness. And then was the biggest test to see what are the Jews going to do when they are in total darkness. So part failed the test, the majority failed the test, the golden calf. What's the golden calf? It's a replacement for Moshe Rabbeinu. That's it there. Like we, we, let's make for ourselves a new leader. Moshe Rabbeinu died, so we need to make a new leader to replace Moshe Rabbeinu. So the idea is that the golden calf is to replace Moshe Rabbeinu, showing the biggest test in the darkness when you're in darkness, you can't do anything anymore. When I'm in my youth years, and I have energy and a desire and everything, I can do. Then the next stage, where there's no light, but I'm still able, I have my strength, and I have, like we spoke about, we have, I have my ambition still within me, everything I'm able to do. But when a person's like elder, so to speak, he can be also elder and he can be 20 years old also, 20 years old, it's every day we spoke about this idea, that when a person is totally knocked out, he can't do anything that's total darkness, he needs the outside help to enlighten the darkness. He needs Yaakov to shine his darkness. I need a tzaddik to open up the light. So the test of the golden calf, what are, you, what are you Jews going to do now? This total darkness, what are you going to do? Are you going to seek Moshe Rabbeinu? Are you going to cry out Hashem, where's Moshe Rabbeinu? Or are you going to look for ulterior, ulterior what's <coughs> options, alternative <coughs> options to make up from Moshe Rabbeinu, which is what the Jews did, unfortunately, and they turned to the golden calf as an alternative for Moshe Rabbeinu. And that's the test that happened then, and that's the test that we go through today, is what we do when we're faced with total darkness. What are you going to do? You can't even turn to Hashem. The situation where you're so dark, you can't even open your mouth to Hashem because of the severity of the darkness. You don't know what to do. And you need to speak to somebody, you need to talk to somebody, even your good friends that are helping you, you know what to do, they don't they don't, they don't they can't, they're not giving you the right words of encouragement, not enough encouragement, no one's giving you good at sound advice. This is where the tzaddikim come and play in a person's life, and why it's not an option, but we'd say today now, it's an absolute necessity to find these tzaddikim of the caliber of Yaakov Avinu, to make that light in the darkness. And the light, the sign that I have the light is again tov, mat tovu, that I'm able to find my good points and able in the darkness to be able to find good in the situation and to start again. That's the sign, that's the indication that I found true leadership in my life. So this is the three stages of the Ten Commandments, two within, and Hashem again, Hashem gives a person to taste this light, this infinite light in his life because you have to have a taste of what's out there. A person can always be in darkness and not have a taste of what's out there because he's going to have no yearning, no initiative to do anything. So we give a person to taste what's called the orange self, the infinite light, and then it's taken away. 
and his job is in the constriction to try to reconnect to it. And then the third and the final, the most important stage is within the darkness. And it doesn't always stay dark. It's not like all oh, dark, 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 and that's until Mashiach comes. No. If I succeed in shining Tov in the darkness, I have already my personal Beit HaMikdash. I already have my third temple on a miniature level, on a personal level, Bezat Hashem. I'm waiting for the collective Mishkan, the third temple. But in the meantime, I'm succeeding by being Tov, thanks to the Tzadikim, we're also called Tov, by the way. The verse says in Mishle, Imru Tzadik Ki Tov. Call the Tzadik, say to the Tzadik that he's good. He's called Tov. So by finding this good, I'm building my third temple. This in a nutshell are some ideas on the Parsha. What comes out again on the practical level is that we're faced with the test which corresponds to Yaakov Avinu. And that means we're in darkness. Yes, situations of darkness, you can't even dub it. We know I have to dub it, I know I have to dub it. But it's just as a heaviness, not letting me even be able to open my mouth. What to do? I need to find the tzaddik. I need to go to the studies, study halls, people who are learning and following the guidelines of the tzaddikim, maybe this will help shine my darkness. This will give me mishkenotecha Yisrael. This will give me the light of being able to enlighten my darkness. We should be zoche to find this light in this generation and not give up. And as the Shem, when enough of the good points are collected from within the darkness, when enough itaruta dimtata razo from below is done, and finally, the whole, the temple for all of Israel, the third temple, which is Yaakov Shelema, the complete Yaakov, will be finally built with Zedesh. Nein. Alright. That was clear. Uh, if the third temple is uh, going to come down, you don't know if it's going to come down or if it's going to be built. We're not sure. There's two opinions, right? Right? It's going to come down from Shemayim. I thought it was only going to come down from Shemayim. I thought Hashem's going to build it. It's only one opinion. You heard a second opinion also? Uh, yeah. I heard two opinions. Yeah. But I would, I would assume that, that uh, it would come down in the night time. Yeah. Psh, not bad. At midnight. Right? Because of Yaakov. Very good. Right? It's a good idea. It would be an evening. It would, be, it, would, it would make sense that it comes down at night time. He would wake up. He would wake up in the morning. He would wake up in the morning. Or at midnight. There's, a, there's always a parallel from the first redemption. What was is what will be. Just like the Jews left Egypt at midnight, so too, it seems, we're also going to leave at midnight. Rav Nossin, he elaborates on this. He says that just as the first redemption was at midnight, so he says like this, so too the future redemption will be in the merit of those Jews who get up at midnight to mourn over the destruction of the temple and to cry over the concealment of the tzaddik. That's what he mentioned to us. All right. What about, um, this, it was uh, 40 days and 40 nights. One of the commentaries says that Moses was there and it was because the, the clock was off that they, that's another example why they decided to build the golden calf. In other words, they they didn't go 24 hours. Bushesh. Yeah. Bushesh. Six the six hour arrived and the Mishra wasn't here yet. They made a miscalculation. <coughs> what was that? Was that because of the darkness or was that because of What were they what, what were they okay, if let's say they made a miscalculation, what were they supposed to have done? Who was there to ask? Aharon and Khor and the seventy elders, etc. Why didn't the Jews ask Aaron and Chor? Hey, what's going on? They would have told them. You guys made a miscalculation. You're counting the day and the night. You made a calculation from the exact moment the Moshe Ben went up, and Hashem is making the calculation of the day and the night. You have to wait still. The time well, didn't come yet, right? Well, I think Chor, Chor actually intervened because they were getting impatient, and he was killed. They killed. They killed him. And, and Aaron, one of the commentaries says, stalled them by making a small type of calf that, and, and the woman gave their goal to make the calf. Right. So, so on the one hand, that's why Aaron's attributed to peace because he's, he's seeking peace between... He's trying to hold on and... Right. And, and right. Not it's not that he really was, you know, 
with them worshiping the golden calf, but he was just trying to save time for when Moshe actually comes down the mountain, or whatever happened to Moshe. <laughs> There's, the, there's a lot of depth into the Jews killing Chur. The Zohar goes into this a lot. The Arizal. There's a lot of depth in how the Jews, what initiated them to kill Chur. If now he is the replacement of Moshe Bain in the meantime, so what pushed them? What, what caused the Jews not to accept Chur's opinion? What was driving in them that you, you Chur, are not the replacement of Moshe Rabbeinu. What caused, what in them, what, it was what caused them to make that conclusion and thus stone him and kill him. They, they, it's in the Pasha, they killed him. Yeah. Vayiven yeah. Mizbeach. It says by Aaron, it says Vayiven Mizbeach. Rashi brings down on the spot the Midrash. He understood from the one who was slaughtered that he has to act smart now. If not, they're going to kill him also, Aaron. So you had to play a trick on the Jews, on the air of Rav, really, mm -hmm. with the Jews watching, this, and they're also participating by not getting involved, by not saying anything, by not doing a protest. It's as if the Jews also were involved in the Golden Calf. They didn't protest, right? So, so there's something here, that our one was doing a, a play a play the game, but he would have ended up slaughtered, and he was willing to be slaughtered, but he said, that, come on, the Jews are going to be destroyed also in the meantime. That's the Pshat given, right? So he stalled and stalled and stalled to do his best to get it out that it shouldn't happen. But he was ready to join in with Hor, to also be killed and stoned. But the question is, what was wrong? What did the Jews or the Arab of find fault in Hor? Well, they, well the, it's not that they maybe found fault in Hor. It's because the mentality was such that coming out of Mitzrayim, they awakened their, their desire to connect with a certain God. So the only gods that they understood at that mo moment was false gods. So they, they tried to make the little, their own god, so to speak. How about Moshe Rabbeinu? Moshe Rabbeinu, that we just spoke about that. Ubecha ya'aminu la'olam. It says, it says yesterday in the Parsha on Yitzhak, that Hashem said, and in you they will believe forever. And we just explained the whole idea that the Jews were going nuts because Moshe Rabbeinu in their eyes was dead. Well, maybe, I think there's, there's also commentary that says that, that they built the cap as a substitute for Moshe. Right, we we'll spoke about tonight. That's the whole right. thing about tonight. Right. So now, what's wrong with Hor? If Moshe Rabbeinu himself told the Jews, here's Hor, mm -hmm. and he told them, so why aren't you listening to Moshe Rabbeinu who told you to go to Hor? You're stoning him? So there's something here. There's something here. We won't go into tonight, because I myself don't know the details fully, but there's something here of well, what Hor represented and why they didn't listen to Hor. Well, well, well. Well, yeah. who's, who's the Gilgul of Hor? Isn't that, isn't that uh, Pinchas? Do you remember anything about that? Because I don't remember clearly. We it's have here a person who knows stuff. Maybe do you remember Hor was the Gilgul of Hor? I don't remember. <coughs> it's, I, it's, it's something to do with Pinchas, and it could be, it could be, I don't know what be. He got some reward as trying to... Because he's cut out. Yes. Because of his wanting to be vengeful right. venge for and Hashem. I think what I, I and his grief really came back as Pinchas, who then didn't die from being the... Psh, and Pinchas was... Eliyahu afterwards. There's a Kana'ud, there's a key, yeah, there's a yeah. vengeance I think, I think, back again. I think yeah. Kur is, is the connection, but... Have to look but there's it. something here. There's yeah. something here. Yeah. But the blemish is that the Jews didn't accept Kurs to be a substitute for Moshe Rabbeinu. They killed him. They stopped him. But Moshe Rabbeinu told you to listen to him. What's going on? Something here. There were only 3,000 Jews involved in the... Uh, That's what it says in the coming up. up that were killed. That were part of the uh, Tetehiko, the uh, Golden Cow. Who were, who were killed. Who were killed. The number given who were killed, or by drinking the water, with, with pieces of the golden calf, or by Saif, whether if there were witnesses, no witnesses, hatra, right, witnesses and warning, mm -hmm. and uh, witnesses and no warning, and no witnesses and no warning. So there were no witnesses, no warning. They drink the water, and like Sota, like a woman who has no witnesses that she fooled around, the water made the stomach blow up and they died. And again, if there was witnesses and hatra, warning and witnesses, don't do, don't do, don't do it, and they, they still did die, they bow down to the idol. So they were killed by a sword, Saif. And uh, the third one was Magifa. Is that if now there was uh, witnesses, but there was no warning. So then Hashem himself, the, there was a plague that just took them away like that. That's the three, the breakup of the three. But all Amisrael suffered because of it. There were 3,000 who were active. 
-hmm. But the rest of the Jews who were not active were also punished. Mm -hmm. Proof is we're all paying for the golden calf. Why should I pay for the golden calf if I wasn't involved? To show that yes, there was a person who doesn't protest. Something very scary in life. When you don't do a mecha'a, when you don't do a protest, then you, there's a punishment. Mm -hmm. The thing is to, to know when and how to do a protest. That's our problem today. And we see the protests burning garbage cans and this and that. You have to know how to do it. It's not, it's not so easy mm -hmm. to, to be able to say it. But some opinions say you have to do it whether they're going to listen to it or not. You have to, there's a hole in Hashem's honor and you have to plug the hole before God forbid it blows up. By just saying uh, a protest, you did your job. Whether they listen or not, I have to do that protest. We spoke about this once, if you remember. Right. You, know, with, Hashem. With, that with. you can't just let it just Chim Hashem. And the attitude in America, everyone has this, it's a democracy, everyone has an opinion, they can drive in Shabbos and this, so everyone's quiet. But here, people are paying when there's a desecration of Hashem's holiness. And whether they're going to listen or not, I'm not concerned. I'm, God forbid, worried about, God forbid, the dam being breached and then there's a flood and everyone gets killed, God forbid. Mm -hmm. So I have to make a statement of... You have to say something. Well, you have to well, say something. Well, you have to know how to say it though, right? In this week's Parsha, this is attributed actually to Yitro. Because when 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 uh, the, the power wants to take the Jewish babies and and, and, and throw and, and build them the mortar as mortar, he asked his advisors what should he do. He asked Eo, Yitro, Yitro, and, and Bilam, Bilam, right? Right. And Bilam said, "Kill him." And Yitro said, "Don't." Right. And Eo, and Eo, was silent. And in, in his silence, that's where he was. He was punished. He was punished severely because he because of his silence. because he did he did stand up for what's right. What's that was Eo. Eo. Yeah. He chose the one who said uh, yeah, yeah, not yeah, to kill. Yeah, yeah. Remember, he lost his whole family. Right. He lost everything, and he didn't do anything, and that's the problem. That's where we learned it from. <laughs> that's where we learned it from. Exactly. As an example. <laughs> it's powerful. Because Yitro, think about it, this Parsha is giving the name over by, by Yitro, right? Who was Yitro? He was the biggest idol worshiper in, in, the, in the Tanakh. In the world, right, at the time. However, because he heard of the miracle I mean, of, 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 of what Hashem did, mm -hmm. he converted. And I believe it's because, because he converted, they give him the, the, the title in the Parsha. I'm not sure. Right, the Zohar says, as soon as Yitro came, and said, now I know that Hashem is greater than all other gods. The name of Hashem was glorified in all the worlds above and all the worlds below. When someone so far comes to recognize Hashem, that for Hashem is the greatest Kiddush Hashem. And that goes, that's also connected to what we spoke about tonight. The dafka from the darkness, for, for someone to make a recognition of Hashem in the darkness, of the good in the darkness. For Hashem, this is the greatest goal. It's not impressive that someone is born in Masharim and he's from and he goes out that way. It's only normal. What do you want? Someone who's born religious and everything, it's understood. That's the Khidush, someone who had nothing. Absolutely no religious education, no Torah, no mitzvot, nothing. Darkness. And from the darkness <laughs> to come to wake up to recognize Hashem, for Hashem this is the greatest thing. That's the goal. That explains why the Jewish people are, are in such a situation today that never existed before. We didn't have 500, 600, 700 years ago uh, egalitarian Jews, conservative, reform, uh, secular, we didn't have this. Or you were Jewish, or you were not. Today we have Jews who don't even know anything about their Judaism, nothing. They have a nice Christmas tree and everything. They do all the things, nothing Jewish. And why is this happening? Because this is Hashem's greatest greatness. Is that in total darkness, right? Matovu Alech Yaakov. That there's Tov to be revealed from the such darkness that of Yaakov. Yaakov's darkness, in other words, that he's, he's come to battle to reveal light from that darkness. This is the goal. This is why we're going through such an upside down situation today. Where there's so many Jews disconnected, not just disconnected, so perverted, so upside down, so crazy. So Dafka in the darkness, when they make any tiny move for Kedusha, it moves worlds. Rabbi Nachman brings an analogy of a circle, they have a wheel, right? So I have a wheel, I have the spoke, I have the center of the wheel, and I have the spokes coming from the center of the wheel. The closer I am 
to the center of the wheel, the closer the spokes are to each other. But as soon as they keep on going towards the edge of the wheel, the outside, of the outside circle of the wheel, they're much more farther. So too, any tiny movement a Jew does in this world, any tiny movement a Jew does for Hashem, it makes, and it commences to how much he's in darkness, it makes the worlds of, 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 of a difference up in the heavenly spheres. Because we can picture that the heavenly spheres are very far compared to this physical world. So any tiny movement, any Shabbat, any bracha, any tzitzit, any tzedakah, anything a Jew does compared to the darkness that he's in and where he came from, by Hashem, this is the greatest light, like each one. And this again, more than anything else, is going to build the third temple. But the only ones who are able to get people in the darkness to wake up are the people who are like Yaakov Avinu, the tzaddikim. That's, that's their job. That's the, that's the goal of the tzaddikim. And only they succeed, successfully can wake up people who are so, so far. So that's the key. To help the Yaakov Avinu, the tzaddikim, to do their job. How can I help on my personal level, even if I'm not such a big darkness, but everyone goes through their other darkness? It's again, by being supportive of the idea that everything I need in life, the solution can be found in the Torah, in the Kedusha. I don't have to go to the Tuma, I don't have to go to Voodoo, I don't have to go to psychology and psychiatry and all types of other means to solve what I need. Everything is in the Torah. I have to look just deeper enough. And I don't see, I have to keep on davening until Hashem opens the doors and gives me the right Eitzah. Because that's what we scream every night in the davening in Arvit. Hashem, give me good advice. Give me the, the, the guidelines, what to do, who to speak to, what. I'm asking for this, Hashem. This is the key.